If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn this morning over to 3rd John, 3rd John. Last week I uh, introduced our study of uh, this little epistle of 3rd John with a possible scenario uh, and I asked the question, what would you do? And by way of reminder as to that scenario, it, it went along the lines of we have people who come to us who've been vouched for uh, literally uh, servants of God and servants of His Word and they come to our church and they want to share, they want to share God's work, God's truth with this body. But myself, as a pastor, uh, I refuse, I forbid them access to our fellowship. I refuse further uh, any possible needed uh, hospitality, even to the extent of feeding them or offering housing even though they're traveling miles and miles and miles to be here. I even go further in that scenario to forbid anyone else in this church uh, from extending any hospitality at all to them. Uh, no reception is to be accorded them, nor are they to be granted any private hearing. Uh, as well. And to go even further, if anybody, if anyone, uh, breaks from what I demand, I would have you excommunicated right out of the church. You're out of here. The question was, what would you do with that? What would you do? How would you respond? Well, the answer to that question is in this book that we uh, started last week. This little epistle of 3rd John. I want to read the text. Let's read it together. I'll read, you listen, but follow along. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when the brethren came and testified to your truth, that is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. The scenario, what would you do if you had a diatrophies? in the pulpit. You had a diatrophies as an elder in a capacity where he could enforce his will upon the body. What would you do with that? How would you respond to that scenario? 
As I stated and as I read, you see that the answer to that question is right here in the text that we're looking at. This book of 3 John. John answers that by asserting this theme, if you will. Walking in the truth requires that in a manner worthy of God, the believer is to extend hospitality unto those who have gone forth for the sake of the name, so that we may, or one may be a fellow worker with the truth. Now I'll repeat that. Walking in the truth requires that in a manner worthy of God, the believer is to extend hospitality unto those who have gone forth for the sake of the name, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. The thrust of this epistle is the believer has an obligation. You and I have an obligation being in the truth. And again, I emphasize the truth. We have to, at some point, we're confronted with a choice. We need to choose whether we're going to imitate what is good or what is evil. In this case, would we follow after a Gaius? A Gaius? Or would we follow after a Diotrephes? Partnering with and in truth is the obligation of the believer, of the church as it relates to those who abide in truth and are proclaiming the truth, who've gone forth for the sake of the truth. Now John, he starts developing this theme by focusing on the primary point of the letter. And if you've read this, and we've read it, I know we've read it three times together as a church, and hopefully you've read it at least that uh, in, in the past week. But we're, we're focusing on the primary point in the letter, and that is the truth and the believer this morning. The truth and the believer. Case in point, Gaius, who is the recipient of this letter. Where we look at this man, and John's co commendation, his commendation of Gaius in verses 1 through 8. But we're only going to take the first five, uh, excuse me, first four verses this morning. And what we'll notice in these verses, as he starts developing this, this, this idea of the truth and the believer, and, and that relationship as they, they relate one to another, we're going to notice three realities regarding the place and the role of truth in the life of the believer, in the life of Gaius, as he's spoken of here. And ultimately, as I stated, by way of application, us. We're the believers. So how, do, how does the truth relate? How do we move in truth? How, what's our relationship? So with that, let's go ahead and get started here. And let's look at the first reality regarding truth and its place and role in the believer's life. Number one, truth is the sphere. The sphere or the realm of our relationships. It is to be that. Look at verse 1. We looked at this in 2 John. I've, I've taken a little bit different... Uh, perspective. I'm not. It, it's the same, but but he's applying it individually here. He says, "The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, whom I love in truth." I want us to notice several things again. First, he identifies himself, and in the introductory message, we talked about this. The author of the letter identifies himself as the elder. He's the elder. Not an elder, but the elder. It specifically speaks of an individual person. He identifies himself with a title that's recognized by the person he writes to. They know, he, he knows who he is. He doesn't have to say his name. We dealt with what that might uh, entail uh, as it related to John personally, why he chose his title. I believe it speaks of his title, his position, but really it's a term of endearment at this point in his life. It's, he's at the end or toward the end of his life. And he's actually uh, recognized by that title. It's a term of endearment, if you will. But he's an elder of what? He's an elder in the church. He's an elder in the body of Christ. 
He's an elder in that which is, according to Paul, to be the pillar and the foundation of the truth. That's what he's about. That's why he writes, he's an elder for the truth in the work and the program of God. Secondly, we need to notice he writes to the beloved Gaius. This to the beloved here, uh, agapeteo, that word comes from agape, where we get agape love, but it's a derivative of that, and it can be translated beloved. And that's a very good way to, to translate that. Some translate, I believe NIV translates it dear friend. Dear friend. Well, well, he is beloved. And what we find is, is he's referred to this way, this way four different times in this letter by John. He's beloved. He was beloved by who? By John, number one, by God, number two, and by the churches and other believers. He, they loved him. Why did they love him? For the same reason John loves him. And he tells why he loves him. He says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, this one who's beloved, this dear friend to me, to God, and to the body, to the people of God, he's loved in truth. He's loved in truth, in the sphere and the realm of truth. Now, I say the sphere and realm not to weaken the point, but to strengthen that point. Because a love in truth is far greater than love outside of truth. It's far greater. You could spin it any way you want to, but a person who abides and exists in truth and his love is in truth and he walks and lives that before others, that is a greater love. And if you, if you want to question that, then look in the Scriptures. Look what John's saying. Look what he said in 2 John. Look what he said in 1 John. Look what he says in the Gospel of John about the Lord and His love. And the love of the Lord in relationship to His truth. See, in the sphere of truth are the greater relationships. And John loved this man. He loved him in the truth. I love you in the truth. I, I love you in lostness. I can love you in waywardness. But the greater love is that common understanding and embracing of truth. He loves this man. He's beloved by John, by God, and by the church because he's in truth. I love him in truth. John said, I love this man in, in truth. The sphere of that relationship was in truth. He uses this term over and over. But he loves him in the truth. This love originates and continues its existence in the realm of truth. Now you say, well, I think we ought to love everybody no matter where they are. I, I agree fully. I agree fully. But we got to love people as God defines love. And the greater love is in the sphere, the realm of truth. It is. And so what he says here is he loves him in truth. That's where John's relationships are. Truth embraced becomes the sphere of of our relationship. Once, once you and I have trusted Christ as our Savior, we've entered into a relationship with the truth. And that affects and becomes the sphere or the realm in which all of our relationships as it pertains to me should exist. And you say, well, what if they're outside of truth? It doesn't change where I exist and where you exist. We exist in the sphere of truth. John's love 
was for this man Gaius, whom I love in the realm of truth. That's where John is. That's where Gaius is. And he's beloved because of that. Because of the truth. And, I, and I'll speak more about this truth at, at the end. But that, that's reality number one that we look at here as we, we consider the, the truth and as, re, as it relates to the believer. But truth is the sphere of our relationships, one's relationship. Reality number two regarding the place and role of truth and the believer. The truth becomes one's truth. What? I love this. This hit me. I, I, I was so blessed by this man that this could be said of him, that I want this to be said of me, and I want it to be said of all of us. The truth became his own truth. It was his truth. He owned it. He didn't just embrace it, it was who he is. And he says that here. Look at verses 2 and 3. Look what it says in these verses. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to what? Your truth. They came and testified to your truth. That is powerful. When you understand what he's saying here. What is your truth this morning? What is your truth? You know what he's talking about? Your truth is what you live out. Your truth is what you live. What, what you manifest moment by moment. That's your truth. Your truth is how you are defined. By those who know you intimately and have watched you over time. And Gaius, the, the truth, was his truth. That's what he lived. They testified not of his work for the truth, but they testified to your truth. He exists in the truth, in truth, in the realm of truth. He operates there, and he's known for this truth. It's so cool to be known to live in such a fashion that, that they refer to that which you manifest as your truth. That is powerful when you understand that he's talking about the truth, the gospel, the doctrines of the faith, the, the orthodoxy, the, the teachings of Scripture. That was His own. They identified it. They testified to your truth. That's what John said. These brothers came and testified to your truth. What truth? Who you are. Your truth. And it's all in this relationship to the truth. For Gaius, the truth was his truth. It was his. The evidence, or exhibit A, is in verse 2. Look at this. This, this, is, this is a mind blower too, when you look at what he prays for here. Or he, uh, or he uh, asked about, uh, for him. He said, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. So the evidence, the evidence of Gaius' truth and him being in truth and living the truth, the evidence here is he says he was prospering in that. He was prospering. His soul was prospering. He's talking about his spirit. He's talking about his person. He was prospering. He's not talking about his material things. He talks about his soul prospering. But look at how he prays here. Look at it again, because I'm going to ask you a question after, I, after we read it again. He said, I pray, beloved, I pray that in all respects, not just some, but all respects, you may prosper and be in good health, that you might prosper materially and physically. Now get this. 
Just as your what? Your soul prospers. Now my question is, is how many of you would like someone to pray for you this way? That the reflection of your spiritual condition is in how you prosper. I, I want you to prosper physically and materially just as your soul is prospering. Some of us might be sicker than dogs. How am I prospering? This man Gaius, the truth was his truth. His soul was prospering. It was prospering. And John's prayer was, you are growing and abounding and prospering in your soul on such a level. My prayer is that materially and physically you would prosper in kind. In kind. That is a very powerful point, I mean, to look at. It's not a principle that if I'm prospering spiritually, these things will happen. But what it does tell us is that as John looked at him, we have physical needs, we have uh, material needs, but what he saw in John was the greatest thing when he looked at John is not what he had or didn't have or whether he was physically well or ill, it was that his soul was prospering. He was prospering. That was the evidence, the first evidence of where he was. The truth had become his truth. That was exhibit A. Exhibit B. His truth was testified to or witnessed by others. Look at verses 3 and 4 here. I was very glad when the brethren came and testified to your truth. And then he goes on, I have no greater joy than this to hear, to hear of my children walking in the truth. So exhibit B, or the second evidence of him making the truth his truth, was the fact that that's the testimony of those who know him. What's coming back to John? What he's hearing about Gaius is that the truth is His truth. That is, He's living it. This man is, is, is a reflection of the truths He embraced. And John, by the way, said, the reflection is of one who is healthy in soul. He's spiritually well. He's strong. He he's has vitality in the truth. But he was testified to. Gaius' life was in accord with truth and it manifested itself in a manner that people took note of it. They took note of it. When, when, when they mentioned Gaius, they mentioned his truth, his relationship to the truth. They, they testified of that. How do people speak of you? Is that the first thing that comes to their mind when they think of you? Your relationship to truth. Your life as a reflection of the truth you have embraced. If I were to ask somebody who knows you over time, intimately so. And I were to ask those people, what do you think, or what would you say, or how would you define John? What would they say? Insert your name. What would they say? I'm going to tell you, it's a wonderful thing to, to have made the truth your own to such a level that when people testify, about you, they speak of your relationship to the truth. That's what comes to their mind. May we, all, may we all be in that position. That should be all of our heart. All of us. 
depending on where Gaius actually was physically, uh, we believe he was in the Asian provinces, and, and John uh, writing possibly, uh, we believe, from Ephesus. But, but the, the actual reach of his testimony could have been as far as Jerusalem, which would have been anywhere from three to 500 miles. People were talking about Gaius. What do people next door to us say? We had people 500 miles, 300 miles talking about this one who the truth had become his truth. He lived it in such a way that he, he was having impact. When, when, the truth, when the truth becomes one's truth, that one has a life that is going to have an impact for the Lord. You're going to have an impact. People are going to take notice of that. There was a dear brother in the Lord that I loved dearly. Didn't feel that he was going to have, you know, he, he constantly was berating his own testimony, if you will, downplaying his testimony and the impact of his life. In this community, by the way. Didn't think he was having much of an impact at all. Just didn't feel like, you know, the, the people noticed that he loved the Lord. Well, God chose to take him home. Received him unto himself. Most of the people in our community thought it was very a premature death. 31 years old. And I'm going to tell you, they were lined up, clear down the block, to just get in there and extend a word to the family of the impact that he had for truth. See, if you live and make the truth your truth, people notice that. They notice it. And it has an impact. People talk. It goes out. It reaches beyond this community. It goes beyond the state borders. It can go clear from coast to coast and around the globe. As it relates to what we do and how we relate to the truth. Gaius was a, a prime example of that. Third reality. The last one regarding the truth's place and its role in the believer's life. Truth is to be the present, continuing, constant of one's life. Truth is to be the present, continuing, constant of one's life. Look at verses 3 and 4. For I was very glad when the brethren, or when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. He says here, two clauses. How you are walking in truth. And then he says, to hear of my children walking in truth. I want you to notice what John did not say. John's gladness and joy are not that Gaius or his children have walked in truth, but rather are walking in the truth. They're walking in the truth. It's a present reality. It is a continuing reality. And it is a constant reality for Gaius. And it's to be for every believer. It's not something, listen, this idea, have walked, have walked is past tense as for those enjoying God's presence right now. We can say that they had walked or have walked in, in, in truth. But for the living, 
The idea is, are walking in truth? Are you walking in truth? Am I walking in truth? I'm going to tell you something. This, these verses at the very outset, truth, 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 truth. That's what he says. He keeps telling us, truth, 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 truth. It's about the truth. You know, that is the very basis, should be, of all that we are. And what we find in this letter, it is the determiner for what we do or don't do as it relates to people. And I want to tell you something. Though it gets painted to be black, it's always good. Though we take stands for truth and it's painted as being evil, it is always good. Because where the truth is, John told us in the past letter, there is God. They have God. If there's truth. They have not God if the truth is pushed out. That's what he says. God's not in that. God will never depart his truth. He's always where his truth is. Always. He's always there. And for the believer, for us, the truth is a present, is to be a present reality. It is, we talked about it in the last letter, similar phraseology is that the truth is to be walked in. Same thing. It's to be a constant, present, continuing reality in the life of the believer. And it was in Gaius. He was walking in the truth. That's why the truth became his own. And they testified as to his truth. John said, they testified to your truth. Was it his truth? Not really. It's God's truth. But guess what? It was Gaius's as well. So yes, it was his. And it should be ours as well. Listen, scriptures teach that life, you've heard that life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. And our life, yours and mine, in, in, is, and I'm talking eternally so, our life, eternal life, is through the blood of Christ. And we're told that the blood that that excuse me that Christ is the truth by his own words. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm gonna say this to you. The truth, think about this, the truth, not not any, not what people say, but this this truth, the truth, this truth. This truth is the lifeblood of of the church and the believer. That's its place. That's its role. Right here, this book. This is what flows through the veins of every true church. Every, every ministry, every outreach, whether it be in the church itself, the community, the surrounding communities, or Africa, Lebanon, Europe, wherever. This is the juice. This is the life of it all. It's the truth. And I'm going to tell you something. It's not many. It's not many truths. It's this truth, the truth. This is it. It's the truth. And I'm going to tell you, John's going to lay out for us in the weeks to come, the next couple weeks, it is this truth that is our lifeblood that determines our relationship to it, its place and its role in our life that determines how we are to respond to people who come for the sake of the name. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for just the opportunity to spend time in Your Word this morning. And I thank You for this little epistle and the opportunity to delve into it. And I pray, Lord, that we might truly grasp the, the message that's conveyed here that the, the truth obligates us toward our fellow brothers and sisters in truth and their service for you. 
May we, may we understand how truly joined we are when we come, into the, come to the saving knowledge of Christ. We have embraced the truth, the teachings of your Scripture. And it joins us in a very powerful, unique, and special way. I thank you for that. I just pray uh, that you, you would cause us to meditate upon what we've looked at this morning. See how our lives measure up, Lord. And my prayer is that your truth, the truth, would be ours. That we could own it personally, as was spoken of about Gaius. Lord, bless each one for being out this morning. I do thank you for each one represented here. I pray that our fellowship uh, this day, one with another, as we would... Uh, uh, be together in whatever uh, context, Lord, that that would be blessed as well. And uh, I just, again, just thank you uh, for, for the forthrightness of your word. Bless each one now as we go. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.